Hello, and welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I am an analyst at Gestalt IT. And each episode, we bring to you some of the luminaries in the IT space to debate a premise and uh, get some thoughts and feedback about what we'll be discussing today. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our guests. Hi, Trisha Howard, at Trisha Kicks SAS, that's S-A-A-S on Twitter, and that's my blog as well. Hi, uh, Jody Lemoyne, Ghost in the Net on Twitter. Uh, my blog is ghostinthenet.info. Hi, I'm Zoe Rose. I'm 5683 Monkey on Twitter, and my blog handle is um, rosesec.com. Uh, all right, thank you all for joining us today. Um, let's dig into the premise for this episode. If you are users of network monitoring software or SIMs or some kind of a dashboard, you're probably used to having about 47 browser windows open at any one given time because there's a lot of different aspects to the tools that you need to get um, information from. Now, someone's probably going to try to tell you that they have the solution to all of your problems and it's four magical words, single pane of glass. And since I said that, you're probably groaning right now. So the premise for this episode is that real single pane of glass is kind of a myth. So I want to turn it over to Jody because we were having a conversation about this recently and you had some pretty strong thoughts about this whole single pane of glass is a myth thing. Yeah, absolutely. Single pane of glass does exist if you're talking about a single product. The thing is the vendors who are always pushing single pane of glass are never looking beyond their product. When we're working in environments that have heterogeneous networks, We've got one single pane of glass for this, one single pane of glass for that, and 27 single panes of glass later, we don't have a single pane of glass at all. We have a disco ball. I'm thinking it's starting to look more like the, uh, you know, the stained glass windows in a church where it's like, oh, everything's very pretty and completely not connected at all. Exactly. So the single pane of glass for a product Absolutely. You know, you look at your Merakis, you look at your Splunks, all that. Yeah, they, they've got their single pane of glass, but they're looking at it from their product. They're not looking at it from the user's perspective, and from the user's perspective, it doesn't exist at all. I think that's fair. Now, Tricia, you work a lot with software as a service, as obvious by your Twitter handle. How do you see the single pane of glass arguments coming along? Because when we were talking about this earlier, I think your eyes rolled back pretty far. Yeah, um, mostly because uh, to to your point, you have the you have the vendor um, single panes, which makes sense. Um, but a true, it's so subjective. It's so subjective. Every environment is different. Even if even if you have your major vendors, which there are the major ones, and most of the single pane of glasses of you know can feed into they have the API and they have this and they have that. The problem is at the end of the day, you're never going to actually get a truly single pane because every environment is different. Even if five of the six tools are the same within two organizations, that sixth tool can completely change how that, how that works. Yeah, that's something that I've seen in my experience as well, is that you know, we can unify just about everything except for that super old tool <laughs> that we have to use to monitor that one system, and there's no way we're ever going to integrate it because whoever wrote it is living on an island in the Bahamas and isn't re returning anybody's phone calls. <laughs> now, Zoe, what are your thoughts about this whole idea? Um, I agree, um, two points, but I do think there is a possibility, but the context um, needs to be clarified. I think that single pane, yes, that would be excellent. My dream would to have a dashboard that I can see everything, but I wouldn't use that to uh, do tasks. I would use that to understand what's going on in my network. I do also agree that it can't be vendor-led um, because, yeah, it, you can't, a vendor's not going to be like, oh, I'll build this solution to work with everything else. Um, I think it would be more something, uh, more like, um, open Wi-Fi and how that's run through an org, not a vendor. So what you're saying is that you would use this as a read-only solution to gather information and detect things that are going on from an analytics perspective and that it should be driven by some kind of a vendor neutral like you know openanalytics.org or something for example. Uh, yeah. Register that domain if you haven't thought about it already. <laughs> but um, how, you know, how would you go about doing that? Because the, the thing we have is, you know, as Tricia mentioned, there's a lot of APIs and there's a lot of integration and people allow you to come in and pull their data but only to a certain point. And in my limited experience with doing this, 
Keeping up with API changes is kind of a pain in the neck because they change so much from version to version. There are documented calls that are deprecated, or we may just wreck the whole thing from top to bottom and say YOLO, man. <laughs> well, I, I kind of view it as uh, when I do things like um, open source investigations, that's the biggest challenge is keeping it up and you build a solution and then it breaks the next day. But I would say more looking at it from a network architect's point of view, um, I'm a Splunk architect, and so Splunk has a way that you can build plugins to work with Splunk, or the very, very default or the very um, minimal is you have Syslog. So I think if it's vendor vendor neutral, um, and they have the option to then send data there however they want it to, or you can customize it as you need it, I think that's highly beneficial because organizations can kind of lead that um, movement and say, you know, we love this, we love your product, but we need it to work with this. And we're giving you 101 ways to connect into it, do that. And so that vendor just has to create this one way to connect into it. Because uh, they know what their product is, the value of what updates are needed for the client. They know what um, is working on the other side, so they can easily do that and, and put that data um, in the community so that, or the code in the community so that then other people can use it. It's a very egalitarian way of looking at it. So it's, it's a halfway point almost. <laughs> so right now, the single pane of glass has been, we control everything from this single pane of glass. Oh, and we have an API for accessing things for automation. Mm -hmm. We move closer to an API-first design methodology and move away from the single pane of glass for controlling everything. What we can do is look at the vendors and say, okay, well, we don't want to be programmers and go at your API for everything, but wouldn't it be great if you could give us a widget that gives us common visualizations into the current API that we can plug into an open framework? So we can have this corner of the single pane being monitoring our VPNs through our firewall and this corner being monitoring our storage networks, and this corner being our network utilization. And that gives us an overall view. And as far as configuring the whole thing, we can go at the APIs or the CLI or whatever ourselves. The important thing is being able to see it all. I think that's actually a really good point because one of the problems that we're starting to run into with single pane of glass solutions is that the panes of glass that we're actually looking at aren't getting any bigger. And so, yeah, it really looks cool when your SecOps team has eight monitors attached to their desk and every one of them is open to a different window of the same dashboard and they're looking at pie charts and they're trying to figure out, oh, you know, we're being hacked because we're seeing a lot of uh, lateral movement. But the reality is, is there's only so much information that we can look at. There's only so much information that our brains can process at any one time, and that's one of the problems that I think we see a lot in the single pane architecture is, okay, yeah, we're loading everything into one tool, but I still have 37 tabs that I have to click on if I want to be able to drill down into IP address or last accessed or something like that. So even though I'm presenting a pretty chart or <laughs> at worst a green light and a red light, um, we're not actually improving things for our operations teams because they're still being assaulted, if you will, by all of this information coming in. So how would we fix that, Tricia? Oof. I don't know. Um, <laughs> To be honest, I don't know. I mean, because it's also subjective by who's looking at the single pane of glass. So different teams obviously are going to care about different things. So I like the point about the community um, because they would they would know what they're looking for and moving away from the, the vendor side. But you're still at the discretion of what the vendor is going to allow you to have, what kind of data is, you know, allows you to have. So if you have one for your organization, one very specific data point that you need, and let's say, I don't know, Microsoft doesn't want you to have that, is it actually going to work? Well, this is where the open API is key. Yeah. Where they're providing the framework, which is a client to the API. And if the API is open and they're not providing what we need in the framework, well, we can go in and tweak what we need out of the API. But I think to go back a step to what Tom said is I think we have to have high level abstraction and then low level drill down. So your main single point of glass, if you will, is your high level view where if there's something wrong, there might be a tiny little red blinking light down in the corner. And then when you click in on that, maybe on a second monitor, you can drill down into a more detailed view. And it eventually gets to a point where you see what it is you need to tackle. You take that offline and you deal with that outside of the single pane of glass. Zoe? 
Um, well, from my experience of working in ops, working in um, security, incident response, and network architecture, you're right in the sense of you're going to want to focus on different things. But the thing that I love about current single pane of glass for per solution is actually the ability to customize what I'm viewing. So I, I would love where I have a monitor, a very large one, maybe maybe it's a projector, and it displays everything. But then I can then go and say, okay, but I want to see this very specific thing, as you mentioned, as well as in my team, these are what's matter, these are what's important. And so I can do the same thing like I can in Splunk, and I can then go and actually code something different to show up. So the report is dynamic in the sense of, it's all, got all the data in the background, but I can choose what to display and how to display it. I also like the idea of um, team members going to be able to build their own specific because in some roles I need to monitor one thing so maybe I can have my own report that can get all the data but I can choose what to show. Well that raises a really interesting point in that the single pane of glass does not have to be static. Mm -hmm. You can have your overall SecOps group watching the whole thing and then you've got the network person over here who really does not need to see the, the SEM. They're, they're looking in at the bandwidth. Still single pane of glass, different widgets that they're displaying and they can customize that. But if we have common widgets provided by the vendors, customizable, possibly open source, GitLab, GitHub, and then we can customize how that creates our single pane of glass, that gives us better image. So let's jump on that for one second because there's a movement inside of a lot of analytics companies, inside of a lot of big data companies, to say, I'm not going to provide you access to my system. I'm going to dump all of my data from your system into a data lake. And I'm going to use that data lake as a single source of truth for everything that I do. And whether or not you're pulling analytics from it, you're doing AI and machine learning against it, it's the single source of truth for everybody. So what if the vendor said, well, instead of me providing you a framework to be able to pull that out of my system and put it on your big shiny pane of glass, what if I just dump everything into a standard data lake and say, have at it. The data's in there somewhere. Get your scuba gear and go find it. As long as you give us the schema to go get what we want, that's great. Baby steps. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. So, so the idea of doing this as a data lake is, is not a bad idea, but since this is a group of security personnel, I'm pretty sure that someone's skin is crawling right now because you want to put all of my data in a data lake, Zoe? Well, I'm thinking from the EU, uh, GDPR, if you put my data in a data lake, I will sue you very quickly and I will make a lot of money. Um, so go ahead. I am happy with that. Um, I wouldn't mind going to the Bahamas. Uh, but um, no, I think that's the wrong solution as well. Um, the other really scary bit for me is if this is going into somewhere that I don't own, um, how do I know you're protecting it properly? How do I know that I'm not creating a single point of failure where um, maybe they don't want to target that data lake for certain things. Maybe they want to target something else. But they can then get that display on their own monitor and be like, oh, am I triggering anything? Does this look normal whilst I do that? Because that would be really you know, useful for a hacker. Mm -hmm. It also depends on where the data lake is and who owns it. Mm -hmm. So if they're giving you the option to own the data plane, put it where you want, and then configure all of the devices to dump to your data lake, that gets rid of that problem. In my opinion, that's a different solution, though, because that is going back to what we were originally talking about, because if multiple vendors are doing that, then you have your own thing, like I said earlier. True. You're just building a framework on top of something you already have. Yeah. Trisha? Right. No, I, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, the first, the first thing that uh, always jumps to mind is, you know, data is useless unless it has a purpose, meaning I can throw all of this data in together, but unless I actually turn that into an actionable outcome, what is the point of it? So in theory, a data lake is perfect, is a perfect solution, but it has to be secure. And if you don't have the, if you personally want to bring it on-prem, that's fine, but you better have the people to not only manage it securely, it, but also extract the data from it, whereas you know having it off-prem or having somebody else manage it would help with that last piece, but that's scary. Raises other problems. It's really scary. And another really vital point there is the right to be forgotten. And if you have a data lake and, like you said, you don't have the skills to extract that data, you're going to end up being sued anyway. Mm -hmm. Why me? 
<laughs> You're just looking for that Bahamas trip. You know, I've never been there. Well, fair. So let's look five years down the road. Is single pane of glass still going to be a selling point for people? Or are we going to drop back to API-driven statistics where we pull on demand what we actually want to see and we don't have a big shiny dashboard? I think, I think, in the sense where I have multiple clients and maybe I'm a company that stock for multiple clients, I think the dashboard is still a sexy idea because they're not actively looking at that one client all the time every second and so they kind of need that trends they need the analysis to support it if i'm doing a single company and i know the ins and outs of it i want the dashboard the analytics as well because you know we can't just rely on one person to do it everything in case they you know get hit by a train or something but also um I'm not going to have a dashboard up the, all the time, especially in the environment where I work from home. At my work, I might have a projector on the wall or a big monitor, awesome. At my home, that's just not feasible. I don't even own a television, so probably not. I've looked at single pane of glass references from vendors since 2002, and they still don't come together in a really, really usable way. So in five years, is the vendor's single pane of glass going to be there? No. Well, it will be in the sense that after 15 years, they still haven't learned not to do it. I, I think it's going to be important in five years, but it's going to be more important that the vendors give us the tool to build our own single panes of glasses because mm -hmm. only we know what our business requires and we're going to be in the best position to build it and we shouldn't have to be coders to do it. We should just be able to put it together, say, I want this widget here, that widget here, I want to drill down here, and it might be different for every employee in my organization. Trisha? 100%. Um, I think, I don't think it'll still be a selling point. I mean, I, it's kind of like how 10 years ago cable was everything, and now it's all Netflix and Prime, where mm -hmm. we pick what we want. Uh, I think that's going to be, that's going to be where it goes. I'm, I've got a slight alter opinion there. It, it does exist to a point. Um, as I said, Splunk, um, you can get multiple types of data in Splunk, all these different vendors, and we can create those kinds of reports. That's why it's really good for like sales and IT, because um, you can do like your infrastructure, it does it all automatically, and you can customize it. You don't necessarily have to be a programmer, but you do have to know how to use their system. So I think realistically, it does exist, and it could easily become a thing. However, if you can afford Splunk, you can tend to afford a few more of me, and you're not going to be a smaller company, so you're going to you know, have a bit more of the resources. So I think maybe, I think maybe the, more, the more consideration is actually um, make it available for everyone versus just be available. And that's where you're looking into things like elk stacks and yes, stuff like yeah. that, where you could theoretically do it for free if somebody's putting together the right widgets. But the funny thing is that of, of all of these potentials to be a single pane of glass, Splunk and Elk have the most, but they're the only ones who aren't marketing themselves as a single pane of glass. Yeah, there's a little bit of irony to that. So I think in, in essence what it comes down to is it doesn't matter how big your single pane of glass is because if what you're looking at is not appealing at all, you're not going to care. You're not going to pay attention and you're going to get distracted. And every time we try to build something bigger or better or integrate it more tightly, that's where we end up with those panes of stained glass where it's a whole bunch of little islands. But reality is, is that they're telling a story. They're educating users. And sometimes you have to have more than one window to do that. And we might eventually get there, or we might eventually decide that this isn't the way we need to go. But the key is, is that the users are going to be what's driving this. Not a vendor, not a producer, but the people who consume it. All right, that should just about wrap it up for this episode of the On-Premise IT Roundtable. We'd like to thank you for listening. Um, you can always find the most recent episode of this podcast on our website at gestaltit.com slash podcast. You can also subscribe to our feed, and you can load it into our um, podcatchers of choice. Um, you can also find us on iTunes and subscribe there. If you do that, we'd like it if you'd leave us a review and a rating. Those allow us to reach a new audience and share some of the premises that we talk about each and every episode here. So for myself... <coughs> for the <coughs> distinguished panelists and for all of our listeners and the rest of the Gestalt IT family, keep listening. <laughs>